Well, good morning, friends. Welcome to chapel. It's my pleasure to introduce again, like we did last week, one of our students expected to graduate here at the end of, uh, end of the month. Looking forward to, uh, to that for you, brother. Mr. Christian Rep. he is receiving his MDiv from the seminary. He comes to us from Germany and is planning to pursue ordination and ministry in the OPC. He's married and has three daughters, and we're delighted that you're able to come and to uh, exhort us or lead us in a devotional this morning. So thank you very much. But if you would, before, please stand if you are able and turn in the red Trinity hymnal to number 481. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Please be seated. Well, good morning and and thank you to the faculty um, for the privilege of giving the morning devotion today. Um, I I realize it's the last week of class and papers are due and so I understand many students are working on their papers right now instead of being here. Uh, I wish I could say I won't take that personal (laughs) <laughs> Here we are. Our scripture text comes to us this morning from Matthew chapter 26. I invite you to open with me Matthew ch- chapter 26, and I'm going to read verses 36 to 46. Hear now God's word. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with them Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. 
Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, and saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, you will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this morning where we can listen to your word and see um, what you have done through your Son, Jesus Christ. And we ask that you give us attentive hearts and eyes to see the wonderful things and to learn and, and grow in the knowledge of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen. When Reverend Chuck Tetrick came to me and asked me if I would want to do the chapel devotion in the last week, I, I was excited and, and honored, and I said, yes, of course. However, as the weeks went by, and the idea of standing here in the last class in front of all the students and professors, I started to dread this moment. And especially yesterday, I felt terrible. And I, I asked myself, is there another way or is there something I could do to opt out? Um, but I couldn't and, and now I'm here. And why, why am I telling you this? I, I think every one of us has moment, moments like this, uh, moments that we are dreading, moments that we, that we fear to face, um, whether it's finals that are coming up or uh, the very first time you preach here in chapel and the, the moment, um, the, 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 the feeling that you have right before you get up behind this pulpit, things you, you dread and you ask yourself, is this necessary, is, is there not another way, uh, and why do I have to do this? And I think this is something that Jesus experienced in the night he was betrayed, something very similar only to a much greater extent and under way worse circumstances. And we are going to see in this text how, how faithful and obedient Jesus was and how, he, how much he loved us and, and with what great love he loved us. So here in this text, Jesus and his disciples make their way from the upper room, from Jerusalem down into the Kidron Valley onto the western slopes of the Mount of Olives to a garden, a garden of it's, it was called the Garden of Gethsemane. This word Gethsemane in the Aramaic language means oil press or olive press. And it's a fitting name for what Jesus experienced in that night. He is hard pressed from every side, in, in every aspect. And he tells his disciples how he feels. The text actually tells us twice how he feels. And he, he takes his disciples, all of them, and he places in them in front of the garden. And then he takes his three most trusted disciples or, or closest disciples. And he tells them that his soul is very sorrowful, even to death. He, as, he, as he contemplates about what is going to happen in the next hours, as, as it dawns on him, perhaps in a way that has never dawned on him before, he trembles. And he tells his disciples that his soul is very sorrowful, sorrowful even to death. He feels as if he could die. 
the, the very burden that, it, it is a burden that is life-threatening in itself. And he asked them to, to pray and to watch with him as he goes a little further. Friends, this is not a comfortable morning devotion with a coffee, coffee mug in one hand and on a, on a nice decliner, um, recliner. recliner. This is Jesus trembling. This is Jesus sorrowful and anxious and, and most likely shaking. He, he falls on his face and he prays to his father. And why? This might make us feel un un uncomfortable, doesn't it? Jesus, our savior, our champion on the ground with his face on, on the ground, he's terrified. He shouldn't be afraid of anything. And yet what we see here is that Jesus is not only fully divine, but fully human. He, he came into this world and he took upon himself the flesh. He, he became man and like us in every way. And he experienced frailty. He experienced uh, fears and anxiety like we do. And, and we get a glimpse of that in this text. The emotions of Jesus Christ, and he thinks about what is going to happen, that he's going to be betrayed in just a few hours and, and handed over to sinners, captured and eventually crucified. And of course, he is he's terrified to die, this gruesome and cursed death on the cross. But he, more than that, he's also terrified to, to drink the cup, the cup that the Old Testament prophets talk about, Ezekiel and Isaiah, the cup, the wrath of God, the anger of God, the righteous indignation. And as he thinks about it, he's half dead, and he cries out to his father. And he asks, take this away from me. And we shouldn't be troubled by this request either. This is a perfect, just, perfectly justified question. This is a natural desire of a human being. This is not like a child asking for a second or third piece of pie, even though you told him that it's enough. This is not like students asking for an extension on, on their papers because they were lazy throughout the semester. This is... Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who never did anything wrong, who, who loved his Father, always loved him, always obeyed him, always brought nothing but joy. And this very Son of God calls out to his Father. And, and God himself testified when he said, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. There's nothing in him that I should discipline or, or correct. As fathers, we know that with our young children, a, a day where we don't have to correct or discipline them, that's, that's a good day. But not so, with, not so with Jesus. He was truly holy, truly perfect. And he doesn't want to be separated from his father. He doesn't want to be not longer conscious of, of this fellowship that was never before clouded, but it begins now in this garden that the Father starts to forsake him. And so he calls out to his Father and asks, let this cup pass from me. And there's no answer. We know what the answer would be or had to be. No, it's not possible for sinners to be saved unless you drink the cup. It is not possible unless Jesus is being made sin, the one who knew no sin, to take the righteous indignation of, of his father upon himself. This is the only way. Other, any other way would, wouldn't work. This is the only way for hope and salvation in this world. And, and we marvel and we ask, how much, 
how great was the Father's love for us. No one of us could object and if, if God would look down to his son and said, it's enough. But he did not answer and we see Jesus, he still has his disciples, doesn't he? He, he gets up and he turns around and he, he goes to his disciples and, and they sleep. And again, here we see another natural um, instinct of, of, human, uh, of, of Jesus Christ as, as this human man, that he wants his, his friends, his disciples to comfort him and to console him. I was just recently with my little daughter in the ER. She fell and she got a pretty good cut on her chin. And if you know her, she's pretty wild and sometimes they wonder if she, all she wants from me is food and clothes. I don't get any, I don't get any snuggle time with her. <laughs> but on this day when we were waiting for hours in the ER, she would not leave my side. She would cling to me and she would, she would not... She needed me, and I kind of enjoyed it, even though it was under unpleasant circumstances. Jesus, he, he turns to his disciples, his friends, and he asks them to pray with him. But they are completely indifferent. They don't know what's going on. They have no idea what Jesus is going through. And do you see here the salvation hang in the balance? And, and Jesus turns to his father, and, and the father starts to forsake him, and, and there's complete silence. And he turns to his disciples, and they fail him. He's alone, he's isolated, he's in desolation. And as we think about this, we need to think back and remember Adam in Garden Eden. Adam, our first father, who lived in the garden under perfect conditions. He had fellowship with God. There was nothing that he lacked. And God asked from him and required of him to trust him and to obey his, his word and not to eat from the fruit of the tree. But the temptation was too great and he failed. And you see here Jesus as the second Adam, hard pressed and tempted with the greatest temptation there is under horrific conditions. His disciples are sleeping. His father forsakes him. And yet his father says, the only thing I need from you is to trust me. You need to drink this cup. And he does. He submits. Again, we couldn't Object if Jesus would turn to his disciples and sees them sleeping and says, This is what I do for you, and you are completely indifferent, you're not worth it. But we see not only God's love for us, that he would not spoil his uh, spare his own son, but the love of Jesus that he would submit completely. To, will, to the will of the Father and go on and, and go to the cross to bear our sins. Commentaries have often pointed out that what we have to do with this text is to look at Jesus and to, to learn how to pray to overcome temptation. And this is what Jesus says here in the text, so it's certainly true we should pray to overcome temptation. But in a certain way, this text is way more unique than that. This text shows us that Jesus, the second Adam, who trembled at the thought of being forsaken by God for the sins of this world, he did not falter. And he went through. He stands in contrast to our uh, first father, Adam. He stands in contrast to the disciples and, and to us. In a certain sense, we could never pray like Jesus in the garden. We could never overcome the temptation that Jesus over, over, overcame. 
he did here in this very narrative. He did what we could never do. He died my death. He bore my cross. He was isolated and desolated. And he suffered all for us to save us from our sin. And he's our high priest. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 17 summarizes it beautiful when it says, Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. To make propitiation for the sins of the people, for because he himself has suffered when, we, when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus shows himself here in this text as our high priest. He went through the greatest temptation, through, through the greatest sufferings. And because of that, we will never be alone. We will never pray alone like Jesus did. There are times where we feel isolated. There are times where we feel alone. Seminary is not always a pleasant time. There, there are certain challenges. Life is full of challenges. There are things that we, that we fear and we are anxious about. How often do we hear for those of, of us who go into ministry how lonely a vocation like that can be. But we will never be alone. Jesus Christ was forsaken so that we can be embraced. How comfortable is it to know that we have a high priest who knows our deepest fears, who knows and is not indifferent. He, he sympathizes with us. And even better, he, he can relate to it because he went through the hardest trials himself. He paid for our sins that we have never, we, that, so that we never have to pay for them. He was alone that we will so that we will never be alone. And because of him, we can pray to God. Because of him, we can come to the throne of grace and bring our sorrows, our troubles to him. And he listens and he hears. And Jesus Christ himself, he perfects our prayers. What a blessed Savior we have who knows our fears. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we know that our words fail to describe what your Son has done for us. We fail to express how greatly you loved us and that you gave your only begotten Son. You made him sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. Father, we marvel and we are grateful for your love and grace. And we thank you that you are not indifferent to our fears and that we have Jesus, our high priest, who intercedes for us. And we pray that as we walk through this life that we will always rest in him and trust in him. May you increase Christ in our lives. We pray all this in Jesus' name.